I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Q&A. Tom, you said we have lots of questions today. We do. We have some really good ones. This one is directed towards... This one is actually for Forrest, and this is from Lisa. Lisa wants to know, this question is for Forrest, do primates exhibit emotions or qualities such as compassion, kindness towards other beings? I've read that some in, in captivity have exhibited some of these things, but it's a learned behavior. So I wonder if a Bigfoot would have these qualities or if it would depend on how hungry they are. Lisa. And it sounds like a question we've had before, but a little bit different with the um, with that last part. So, Forrest, what are your thoughts? Oh, yeah. Primates uh, exhibit all sorts of uh, uh, emotions just like us. I mean, you know, they're um, – you can and – and, and both wild and, and domesticated. And, I mean, let's face it, if they're in uh, zoo situations, they're they're pretty much domesticated. Um, Coco the gorilla is a prime example. I mean, she, uh, you know, once she learned sign language, could actually uh, formulate abstract thoughts, which we thought they were never capable of doing. And she could. She talked about how she missed her mother um, and that uh, um, she missed the jungle. So and she and, and Coco had pets. She she loved baby kittens and she had cats. And when one of her cats got out of the enclosure and got killed on the road, she actually expressed to her keeper that Coco is sad. Coco was heartbroken over her kittens, uh, over that particular kitten. But she had, I think, uh, a variety of cats that uh, she kept as pets. So, uh, but you can watch, you can watch monkeys and you can watch gorillas, I mean, uh, and chimpanzees, and when they look at their babies, you can see the mother expressing, I mean, the look in their eyes is enough to tell you that they uh, are expressing love to that infant. And uh, and then there's times that, uh, you know, when the infant does something that they shouldn't have done, this is what's really funny. Uh, chimpanzees do the same thing, gorillas do it, and so do macaques. They get down, and they will stare at them. I mean, you. I, this is the the. You know, you've heard about the look that you get from mom. The, you know, the look from hell. <laughs> well, this, this is the same thing. It's the 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 primates all do the same thing. They look at them and, and they'll fur their brow. And and if the baby is not looking at them, you'll see them grab the head of that baby, and uh, sometimes very brusquely, and you know, turn the head around and look at me. Look at me. I'm, you know, don't do that again. You know, I mean, that's it's very distinct that they're telling that 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 infant, you know, you listen to mom and you don't do that again. And um, but I mean, on the same token, they uh, and when what I love watching is when they're trying to teach them to walk. I mean, even even baby gorillas, chimps and macaques have to learn to walk. Uh, and so when they're trying to toddle along on each, on their four feet. Uh, you'll see the mom put them on the ground, and sometimes the baby will throw a temper tantrum, just like a, a <laughs> we've all seen children do, go down the floor, beat their head on the floor, and, and scream and yell. Well, sometimes the, these these uh, small infant primates will do the same thing, and then mom will walk a little distance away, and then she'll lay her head almost uh, level so she can actually eye, eyeball the baby, get down on that baby's uh, level and eyeball them, and... And as you can tell, and as she'll baby talk to him. She'll smack her lips in, uh, in a very loving fashion. And the baby will start doing the same thing and then start toddling toward her because that baby understands that mama's wanting you to come to her. And that's the way they teach them to walk. So. All right. Well, I got a question from a listener that I wanted to answer before we go to the next question, Tom. And that was um, uh, we were asked if campfire talk was a replacement show for the bigfoot in history and the answer is no um we're just waiting to get materials in from our readers 
uh, to continue Bigfoot in history. So that'll be coming back as soon as we get more material. But for now, um, the Campfire Talk is its own show. Absolutely. And Bigfoot in history, is a, it's a favorite of ours because it, it, it ties in the historic precedents of and, the... And speaking of those shows, Bigfoot. right, we could really, we could really use listeners help, uh, in, you know, sharing the shows on YouTube and, uh, you know, liking it and everything because, um, you know, that algorithm doesn't, doesn't, uh, show up in people's timelines on Facebook or not Facebook, YouTube, uh, if we don't get listeners participation. Absolutely. You know, and we should have mentioned that at the beginning of both episodes. Sorry, Tom. I, I didn't mean to cut you off there. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. But really, um, yeah, if you like the show, let us know. Click the like and subscribe and click the share button. It really helps us out. Feeds the algorithm. We want to feed it. Okay. Um, this is a question. This is from a different Lisa. And this Lisa says she lives in Oklahoma. So she says, I have a lot of Oklahoma. A lot of coyotes where I live in southern Oklahoma near uh, Eureka Lake. Hope I pronounced that correct. Chuck, tell me if I got that right or not. Uh, coyotes That's right. don't. That's right. I got it. I did it. All right. I got an Oklahoma accent. <laughs> coyotes don't always mean Bigfoot, do they? There have been alleged sightings near here a couple of years ago. I really enjoy learning about Bigfoot. You guys are so knowledgeable. So um, I guess we're going to throw this one towards Chuck. Have there been any um, validated, legitimate sightings near Warica Lake in southern Oklahoma? Uh, Warica Lake, I'm familiar with that area. I, I didn't know about the sightings, though. That That's kind of new to me. I haven't heard of that, but um, it doesn't surprise me. But as far as the coyotes go, um, there's there's coyotes pretty much everywhere around here. And you hear them a lot. You see them a lot. So, Going back to the lake for a second, would, would that be a place that you would think might be... Um hot spot or something that would appeal to Bigfoot? I think it would appeal to Bigfoot. I mean, I, it seems like a lot of the places that I go, there's, there's always, you know, I live between two rivers, so I'm actually in a pretty good spot. And it seems like to me, just my opinion, I, I don't know if it's a good one or not, but it seems like they, they travel the waterways and any, anywhere you see lakes or, or creeks or rivers or streams uh, your the chance of you actually seeing something is, is going to be a whole lot better than going out in the middle of a pasture somewhere all right good deal we'll take that as a yes or a definite possibility okay well thanks lisa um this one i'm going to throw out towards will and Brian, he wants to know, would ammonia attract a Bigfoot? Because we've talked about using it as a deterrent, but this person wants to know what it attract him. And I wonder if they're thinking it would attract him in a sense that they would be, um, you know, maybe they'd be provoked or aggressive. I'm just I'm speculating. It's a short question, would ammonia attract a Bigfoot? Yeah, I can't, I can't see any qualities that would attract you know to a smell like that it's more repellent than anything but um the only way it might attract them like you said that's a good possibility is if they felt challenged and i suppose uh, you know they would have to have a stink that was worse than the ammonia for that to happen but um you know yeah they might they might be curious to see what else is big and bad maybe stinkier than them Okay. All right. So this is from a gentleman named Serge Master, and uh, he wants to know, hey, guys, when the discussion of the Albert Osman incident is discussed, um, we dismiss it as a hoax. One of the reasons being is that you say that if it truly happened, uh, why is it not been replicated at some point? 
Well, since this is the argument, how would you explain the tale of Enter's Mukaluk? Let's see if I can. Mullicat Harry. Okay. Mullicat Harry. Okay. An Indian who in Vancouver in 28 disappeared. All right. So you know the story. Um, what's what? What are your thoughts on that? Okay. Well, I, I'm not going to talk about that one, but since we're he's talking about Ostman, the main theme of the or main thrust of the argument wasn't that it wasn't repeated. That was a supporting argument. The main argument was that Rene de Hendon knew Ostman for many, many, many years, and they talked every time they would talk. They would talk about his encounter, and over the span of at least 20 years. Ostman kept changing the fundamental details of the story often. It wasn't just one change or two changes. He changed it throughout that time period. So Rene dismissed it as a hoax because there were too many big changes to his story. It had nothing to do with anything else. It was That was the main feature of why it was felt it was a hoax. And it wasn't just him. It was many of the other prominent people in the subject back in those days. <clears throat> Well, and that, I mean, that's, that holds true for any kind of story, whether it's Bigfoot or anything, when the story changes and the details change, you really got to ask yourself, why is that happening? Yeah, I mean, some of the details can change. That's, that's understandable if you, you know, because you're, you're jogging your memory, maybe in some of the, the details that weren't maybe as, maybe you didn't think about as much at one point, let's say, um, you know, until until somebody asked you very pointed questions about it, then you, you had to think about it. But it was the fundamental details that would change. Okay, so like the direction of the story and that sort of right, thing. Right, right. Okay. Well, that's interesting. I um, I think you mentioned that. I kind of forgot that. So that that's a very important, it's a very key point. Um. Okay, so the next question, I like this one. This is from Amy. Amy says, hello, everyone. Do you think that Teddy Roosevelt, do you think Teddy Roosevelt created the National Park System to protect the creatures? Could it be, could the Bauman story really be his because Bauman's first name was never revealed and the level of detail seems to be far beyond your average campfire tale? This one is for Forrest. Okay, so this is a two-part question, so this first part is for all of us. Well, what do you think? Well, no. The Park Service, okay. Teddy Roosevelt used to go out west because he had poor health, and he was basically trying to man up, you know, become tougher. Um, so he would go out west, and in one of these times, and he would write books, you know, about the stories he would collect from people, and it was all kinds of stories. And in the beginning of the story... He says that, you know, Bauman was a grizzled old hunter. You know, he was an old man when he came to him and told him the story. And this must have happened many years before, um, you know, he told Roosevelt the story. So it was just, you know, Roosevelt passed it off as a, as a ghost or a goblin story. He didn't think it was anything else. In fact, I think it only occupies, you know, two or three pages in his book, Wilderness Hunter. So... You know, Roosevelt wasn't a Bigfoot believer. We'll put it that way. He just wasn't into all that. He was just collecting lots of different stories from Frontiers people. Oh, that's interesting. Well, what are your thoughts, Will? Do you think this guy, do you think it was a Bigfoot? Do you think it was a legitimate story? Bauman? Yeah, I think it was legit. Yeah, it has all the earmarks of a... It does. Big, yeah, it really does. And, you know, Roosevelt saw all the wildlife, so I'm sure that's the reason he created the Park Service. Not just the wildlife, but, you know, the real beauty of the western part of the country. And we definitely want to thank him for that. Okay. Second part. This is also from Amy. This one is for Forrest. So maybe this is a little bit of an inside joke, but it says this was for Forrest. Besides John Wayne, how about Sean Connery? Love the show. Look forward to it every week. We appreciate, I appreciate all the hard work you guys are putting in the shows together. Sean who? Sean Connery. Oh, Sean Connery. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, of course. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love those uh, Welsh guys and the Scottish guys. Mm. Sam Hewen, too. Mm. Yeah. 
All right. Well, there must have been it must, this must have been one of the episodes I missed when I was out. So, all right. Manly man. Oh yeah, I was talking about uh, you know we're, we've gone to well we need to go back to uh, less feminist. Uh, just quit asking the men to find their feminine side. Let's find their masculine side. So you know, yeah, give me a manly man any day of the week. So yeah. Okay, this next one is from Devin. <clears throat> Yeah, really good question. How does Bigfoot know how to find people, campers, hikers, hunters in the woods if he wants to avoid contact or on the opposite side want to have an interaction with them? I'm referring to the counts that Bigfoot seems to fixate on specific individuals or groups. Does Bigfoot have a map in its head of each area it enters into or visits? Well, I'm sure there. And in Forest, I'm sure you'll agree, they're intimately aware of their their home, their environment. Exactly. And, and primates are curious. I mean, you'll find even in the wild that uh, chimpanzees and <clears throat> gorillas, even though they may remain hidden, they will uh, sneak up on groups to figure out what they're uh, all about and what they're doing. So, and, humans are the no- they're- and humans are the noisiest damn creatures out there. Oh, heavens, yes. I mean, you know, this. <laughs> I don't care how quiet we pretend to be. I mean, we've lost that uh, ability to, unless you're in these primitive societies that uh, still retain that quality, uh, to be able to sneak around in the woods and not make enough noise that uh, uh, we don't sound like a damn bulldozer coming through. Well, and that's a good point because we don't have... Unless you're a hunter, there's really not a need for the stealth. Well, the hunters do, you know, the hunters will, you know, they're smart enough to camp in one area far enough away from their hunt site and then put your food far enough away from, you, know, you don't want it next to your tent and that sort of thing. Well, here's here's but, the thought. Uh, I mean, every animal out there in the wilderness has a very big stake in being stealthy in all of their movements because if they're not, they can be eaten. And, and I suppose exactly. that even goes for, you know, large bears. You know, things can happen to them, other bears. Um, or, you know, if nothing else, they can be, you know, run off a kill, let's say, and lose their meal. Uh, where humans just, we don't have that. We just, we don't give a damn. We think, you know, nothing is going to hurt us. Everything runs from us, so we can just do what we want to do. Yeah, we, well, we sure. developed an attitude that we're the biggest and the baddest out there, and we're alphas. Well, let me tell you what. We are not the alphas out there. No, we're not. <laughs> well, and also our behavior is, a lot of it is conditioned on the civilization. You know, we just walk around the city or urban or suburban areas, and we don't have a need to be stealthies, and we just we carry that with us into the, into the wilderness. So, yeah, good point. Okay, Melvin wants to know, he says, greetings, I have an interest. I have an interesting thought recently, and would like to see what you guys think about it. Australia is a very unique continent, famous for having animal life that is found only on that continent, largely due to it being isolated. So, how did the Yowie, who shares so many traits with Sasquatch, come to live there? My thought is that these creatures must be extremely old, far older than humans, uh, when their origin. Um, being before the separation of Pangea, how else would they come there? What are you guys thought? And I think that's an interesting well, question. okay, you got to look back in geologic history though and see when Pangea broke up. That that predates the dinosaurs, so uh, it's not likely there was these things around then. But lower sea levels would certainly have opened up, you know, migration routes that don't exist now. Well, all of Indonesia, Melanesia, and all used to be actually connected to Australia. And even um, we also have to remember that Antarctica used to be a lush and tropical um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, continent once upon a time. And all of these continents were actually uh, connected. And uh, during the Ice Age, especially uh, when the sea levels were lower, just like you, uh, I mean... The, there was a lot more land exposure, just like what you had said, and uh, there was 
you know, we've had multiple uh, ice ages. It's not just one. So uh, these these uh, animals, uh, you know, traverse. I mean, you even got reports in England, and a lot of people don't realize that once upon a time, England was actually connected um, uh, to a larger portion of uh, Europe, and uh, all of those island countries uh, were we're not we're not islands so uh so we we have to look back in the geological time and you know understand that you know things but the earth is in constant motion so uh i mean it's even changing now under our feet so you know yeah, i just looked at it and years from now, it won't even look like what it looks like now I, I just looked up pangea uh there probably were dinosaurs at least some at that time period pangea formed between 300 and 335 million years ago and began to break apart about 200 million years ago. So, um, yeah, the, the primates didn't exist yet then. Yeah, well, so no, let me... Little, little mammals crawling around in holes. All right, so I'm going to back up a little bit here. I think the, the real question that he, that's being asked here, and I think it's a good one, is you have a lot of unique animal life in Australia that you don't have anywhere else in the world. How is it that we have this one particular creature that is virtually identical to what we have here in North America? And we have that, and it's just the one example. What was it, Forrest? I think I read an article, and they talked about primates where, I believe it was around 50,000 years ago, they called, the article, in the article they talked about Earth being a true planet of the apes because primates were everywhere on the planet at that time. Mm-hmm. And they don't even know yeah. how many different species there were. So, Well, it's just, it's just like the early Homo species. I mean, we're finding out uh, now, I mean, like burgers, uh, uh, the primates, I mean, primates, the Homo species, the Homo neanderthals, I mean, I can't even say it, uh, Nalede, Homo Nalede, and then the Homo Saledi, that he has discovered, um, <clears throat> and I, I, the Homo Solidi, um, and I'm probably not pronouncing that exactly correctly, but his nine-year-old son actually found that one, and they've only found two individuals of that species. I mean, at that, and that was what, you know, the datings that they got on that Homo Naledi uh, group in that cave uh, was actually, they were very archaic primitive form of homo but they were actually they got a date of 500,000 bp when they were thinking it was going to be several million years bp they were actually still existing while the other uh, homo neanderthalensis and uh, homo sapiens sapiens um and you know chroman young man and all those guys were roaming around and they're they're finding uh sites in laos and uh cambodia and uh, all in Melanesia now, and uh, the Homo floresiensis, the the hobbits, and um, you know everybody's going. Oh, how'd they get there? Well, because all of this land was all connected at one point in time. Right. Yeah, when, and they just walked. They walked there. And that's the and, thing people don't understand when you know during the ice ages, not just one ice age. There were there were multiple ice ages. You know when all that ice was locked up. You're talking about um, you know ice sheets that were a mile thick that you know covered north america well that water had to go somewhere from the ocean so it you know sea levels dropped it significantly and created all these land areas so they could have crossed easily during those times oh yeah and and it's like uh the neanderthals i mean uh, they they have a lot of cave sites that they found in france and uh, spain that uh, are just rich with uh, fossils there but you know let's face it if <clears throat> there was any excavations to be done out there what used to be plains out there uh where the instead of the buffalo roaming it was mammoths and mastodons roaming out there and all this mega uh fauna uh, of the ice age uh, that they were roaming out there on these plains that were off the coast what is now the coastal uh areas of uh Spain and France and all of this uh, uh western Europe there they were hunting all out there, and they probably had tons of settlements out there. But we'll never see them because they're all underwater now. Right. So, and it's even tougher on land know. today because those big ice sheets, you know, they're grinders. 
you know, they, they would oh, yeah. turn rock into rubble because with their even slow movement would do that. So, you know, any yeah. kind of biological stuff that was there would be pulverized. Yeah. Yeah. And if you want to see that happening, it's still happening in uh, northern Canada and Alaska. Go take a trip to uh, on a, a cruise ship to Alaska and you can see that happening on a day to day basis up there. I mean, I lived up there for 17 years and the glacial silt and everything that you see in the rivers is just amazing. And the, the rivers uh, and such are they have so many minerals that have been washed down out on the mountains that the 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 lakes and the uh, the rivers are literally a tr- beautiful turquoise uh, color, and um, uh, the Kanek River especially. And, uh, uh, and, and it's just uh, you know it's a day to day basis up there, and that's what uh, you would have seen in the uh, ice age times. And uh, you know it's it's hard to imagine you look at it now it's that there, there should be uh mammoths still rolling roaming the country of course some there's some people in alaska that say that there are in some of the valleys and uh what is that valley that uh, the, the the headless valley what's the i'm trying the to valley think of the it headless men or something like that yes up in canada uh, that people that have gone into there say that there's still megafauna up there in that uh, valley. And it would not surprise me that there might be pockets of them that have actually lived because they have an island off the coast of Alaska. I didn't mean to get off on a tirade, guys, here, but there is a, 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 a in Catalina Islands, another example, that they had mammoths still on those islands up to 3,000 years ago. That is an absolute blink in geological you time. You know, the Sasquatch would have fit very well with the megafauna. It's kind of megafauna itself, really. Well, yeah, and, you know, there's a lot of people that, that think that Gigantopithecus, uh, you know, they never really decided was it a quadrupedal animal or was it a bipedal. I mean, I'm sure, pretty, sure it was a quadrupedal animal for sure that probably was bipedal at, at uh, you know, certain times, uh, just like most primates are. But, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know... And, and I'm not going to say it is not the uh, predecessor to uh, Bigfoot, because I don't know. Uh, and if the Chinese had quit grinding up their bones for uh, whatever purpose that they use them for, uh, we would have a lot more uh, information on uh, Gigantopithecus, Blackie. But, uh, you know, we have to, you know, they're now finding actual sites of, uh, of fossil remains of them. So at some point in time, maybe we can actually have a, um, and, and they existed during the uh, the, the ice age, mm-hmm. and uh, and you know they think that probably what happened once the climate started changing. Guess what, guys? <laughs> it was you know no, climate no change on the earth. <laughs> 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 they were being forced to eat uh, fruit because they saw a change in their dentition status, uh, and uh, they think that these animals probably were more like the panda and ate things like bamboo and such. And um, because they've got these huge grinding teeth and obvious, you know, with the, the sagittal crest on them, they, they had this huge, massive jaws, too, for grinding. So they probably more had a, a, a diet of something like the panda with bamboo. And then when, when the climate started changing, they started eating more fruit, and the fruit was actually damaging their dentition. Mm-hmm. So, and they've seen this in the, the fossil records, so they think that that might have brought around uh, about the demise of the Gigantopithecus blackie. Okay, Tom, what do we get next? Okay, so I've got one here. This is, we got a couple more questions. Um, Jason wants to know how come it would be illegal to hunt or shoot Bigfoot if it's just another animal. And I think... Was it Ohio? Um, somebody had somebody legalized. Oh no, Chuck! Uh, Chuck can tell us that was in Oklahoma. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> What's the deal yeah, with that, that Chuck? Is this is that still going on, or what? What are the how are they handling that? Well, when they first come out with it, uh, it was they wanted one dead, and it was a two million dollar bounty, and um, I guess the state legislature decided, you know what? we're going to have too many accidents of people going out in the woods looking for these things and somebody's going to get shot and killed. So they, uh, they actually changed it that you, they want one captured and 
the bounty on that right now is like three million dollars uh, for a bounty on one that's captured. But you know, you guys know, and I know that they're they're not going to capture one. That's that's going to be pretty hard to do. And you guys know about the the ordinance of Skamania County, Washington, right? The one that was back made back in 1969, and that yeah, it's illegal. <clears throat> oh, yeah. and, and that's where it made it a felony to kill a Bigfoot. Well, um, I, I was I used to go nose around at the Skamania County Pioneer newspaper for old articles and things. And back when I was looking, they actually had them just in a closet on the floor, <laughs> so you had to kind of go through and <laughs> dig through them and and see what you could find. But they were nice, you know. Used to let me go through there. But I met Roy Kraft, and Roy Kraft, uh, for anybody that's seen that ordinance, a copy of it, he's his signature's on it. And I think he was kind of the driving force with the county of uh, Skamania County commissioners when they enacted that. And it was, had nothing to do with protecting Bigfoot whatsoever. They had a guy who was kind of a crackpot, and he would go out in clear-cut areas and sit on a stump, and, and Sasquatches would just appear out there to him you know, sometimes by the dozen. And he was going to, he let it very openly known that he was going to go out and shoot one. And he had, had some people there convinced to go with him and do it. And, you know, I've been shot at hunting. So out in the open by my truck in the sun. So I, I know that people don't pay attention to what they're shooting at. They shoot at something that's shaped like a man when they're supposed to be shooting something that's shaped like a deer. Uh, and that's what they thought. They thought, okay, this is going to cause a bunch of accidents. So they enacted that and kind of nipped the whole thing in the bud. Yeah, and it, there have been incidents. There was one where somebody shot a gentleman in Idaho, I think it was a couple of years ago. And when they caught the perpetrator, they said, why did you shoot him? He said, Oh, it was a Bigfoot. Why do you think it's a Bigfoot? Well, he wasn't wearing a vest. <laughs> and Chuck, I'm sure you you, okay. probably, you you can just see that happening. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and the guy that that started all that was one of the brothers of uh, the siege of Honeby that took place. Oh boy, he actually he actually became a member of the legislature and and they voted him in. And was that Mike or next the other thing you brother? know he's I, I'm not sure. I can't. I can't remember his first name, but sure's sure's all get out as soon as he got in there. He's the one that put the bounty on him. Oh boy, that could that could go sideways in a lot of directions. Okay, we have two questions left, so we'll run through these real quick. Kareem, Kareem wants to know, as we know, Bigfoot is a good swimmer and can also dive into water. Do you think Bigfoot hunts fish underwater? And if so, have there been any witnesses on this behavior? What do you guys think? Well, they I'm going to say fresh, yes. Uh, I don't know about the fish, uh, but I know that they have uh, recorded uh, uh, people telling stories about them crossing the Columbia uh, River down there all the time, down in the gorge down oh, there. I know, I know the place where it is, where it happens. Is that seven? Is that the dolls there? No. No. I, I'm not going to say where it is because people will be all over oh, the place. Okay, okay. <laughs> but I, I can tell you privately where it is. But I know the spot. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, and will we have the story of the guys who are in a canoe, where the Bigfoot dove into the water and and then flipped the canoe over oh, on yeah. them? Chuck, what do you think? What have you heard about that? Was that was that in Ohio? that took place uh you know i don't recall offhand there was i the, the one i'm thinking of was in new mexico where or the one tw told us where the guys were out fishing at night and and the thing went out in the, in the lake and flipped their boat over but i'm not sure if that's the I same think there story was a similar no i think there was a similar story i think up in ohio uh a guy and his brother were fishing at night and there was a there was an island out there and they went to that island and when they got to that to that island uh they started getting rocks thrown at them and oh yep yeah and one of them i think one of them actually got hit or something by by one of them or something but they barely got it out of there and it it tore them up i mean they they were they were having 
that had issues with going out and and everything else because of it. it it was a pretty traumatic experience from what i understand that's that's the story that i was told that's um, interesting it's it's similar kind of a story isn't it? it is but as far as the catching fish underwater I, I would surmise that why would they not if they have an opportunity they can see a fish we know they like fish it's well, speculation Conjecture on my part, but my, my vote is yes. Yep, they oh, grab yeah. the fish. Go ahead, Forrest. You know, here. Oh. Well, there, there's a there's a video that somebody took in Louisiana uh, in a bayou somewhere. And um, I think it was Louisiana or maybe it was Arkansas, but it was in a bayou. And this guy was just floating along in a canoe. And I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, whether you want to believe it's a Bigfoot or not, but it looks like a Bigfoot standing there in the water. And it didn't even see him floating along, and he was filming this thing. He heard the noise, the splashing in the water, and this is, it's actually grabbing its stuff in the water, and whether it's trying to catch frogs or fish, I don't know. I mean, it didn't uh, stand up and identify, this is what I'm hunting for, you know. But the gentleman did film all this, and it's quite believable. It looks like a real Bigfoot in the water, you know, and it looks like it's either hunting for fish or hunting for frogs. Last question, Tom. Well, you know, there's... Oh, go ahead, Chuck. I'm sorry. There, there's all kinds of stories here in Oklahoma where they, you know, we noodle catfish around here a lot. And there's there's reports of them seeing, doing the same thing, noodling catfish out of, you know, out of the riverbanks and stuff. Well, it's like the site we have in uh, Arizona. That's There's tons of catfish in that little river uh, that Jason finds all these tracks by, so I'm sure that's what they're doing there. You all know what noodling is, don't you? Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we just, somebody should explain that real briefly to our listening audience who Chuck? isn't familiar we'll, we'll with Chuck that. We'll let Chuck do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I've, I've done it. I've done it a few times. Uh, it's where you go down rivers and streams, and you find... Uh, there's certain parts of the year, times of the year, when um, the catfish actually dig a hole in the side of the bank, and that's that's where they procreate or whatever. That's where they do their thing. Anyway, uh, you go down through there, these rivers and creeks, and you and you uh, you use your hands, and you uh, take your hand. Most of the time, you wear a glove, and you go down there and you grab a hold of the the fish's mouth and put half your hand in his mouth and pull him out of the hole. And, um, uh, that's, that's what, what they do around here. I, like I said, I've done it. And biggest fish I ever caught was 45 pounds. It, he was a monster. Good Lord. Yeah. That was my next question was <laughs> some of these fish are really big. They're pretty huge. They are. Okay. Tell them we got time for okay. one more question. All right. So this one is also from Kareem and this is an interesting question. Does Bigfoot wear the hides of its victims to pretend it's something else like a wolf hide? That may be why people sometimes think it's a dog man. I've asked this before, and Will said Mr. Black will talk about it. And then a comment, very nice comment. Tom, I hope you're better. Yep, I'm doing good. Unfortunately, they're giving me treatment, and it's working, so I'm going to be around for a while. <laughs> But going going on the first part of that question, it is kind of interesting. Do you think they wear the hides of their victims? Well, I don't think it's a matter of thinking. You have to go on what witnesses say. And I've never talked to anyone that said that that's what they thought. What about you? What yeah, about in you, other Chuck? words, would they wear wolf skins and that sort of thing? Yeah, what about you, Chuck? Have you heard any of that? I I have not. And... You know, I I don't know what to think about that. Actually, it's that's just a something that I've never seen, or uh, I've heard, heard some stuff like that, and I've seen some pictures, but I I can't tell one way or the other what I'm actually looking at when I see something like that. Yeah. So was that anything that we talked about? Mister Black was going to comment on. Uh, yeah, he hasn't yet, but um, you know, I, my thinking is. Well, you're already hair covered. Humans wore hides because we're not hair covered, and they probably use that as protection. Um, you know, 
and as far as fooling other animals, they're going to, they're going to catch the creature's scent, you know, so the visual fooling isn't going to do much, um, because the scent will give them away. All right. Well, any final thoughts or comments, guys? We're out of time. Well, I want to thank everybody for the questions. These are excellent questions. You guys are what keep the topic alive. People have questions and send them our way. Questions at creekdevil.com. There are no bad questions. So we love to hear from you. Questions at creekdevil.com. And same thing with encounters. If you've had an encounter, we'd love to hear from you. And just shoot us an email at the same address. Chuck, Forrest, anything final? No, just good right. questions as usual. Uh, same here. All right. Well, thanks for the questions, everyone. And, uh, you know, our answers aren't always perfect, but uh, we do the best we can. So thanks for stopping by, folks. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.